So I think we'll uh, we'll try to get started, everyone. We'll get started in a second. No worries. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. I think we're going to try to get started. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to uh, get some food, there's uh, food just in the other room. Please help yourself and uh, and come back. Um, my name is Byron Sheldrick, and I'm the Associate Dean Academic for the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences, and I want to welcome you all to this uh, session of the, that is co-sponsored by the Hub for Teaching and Learning Excellence uh, of the college and the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute. And it's looking at questions of risk and reward in community engaged learning. Before we get into that, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Guelph resides on the ancestral lands of the Attawandran people and the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and that we recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon covenant to this land and offer our respect to our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. Uh, and today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit people, and acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to this land where we learn and work. So with having said that, I'd like to just, um, I'm not going to say much today, that's unusual for those who know me, uh, but that's largely because I also have been um, uh, suffering the last couple of weeks uh, with an inner ear problem and vertigo. So I'm, I'm about at my limit for standing in one place before I kind of topple to the floor. So I'm going to go back to my chair uh, where I'm nice and stable. And I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay Thompson from uh, the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute who will introduce the session and our panelists and uh, outline also a little bit about this amazing room uh, which is our new interdisciplinary hub space. And so I'll turn it over to Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks, Byron. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room who I know and some who I don't, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Thompson, and as Byron mentioned, I work here on campus at the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute. Uh, so I'm the manager of Community Engaged Learning, and I happen to sit as SESI's representative on Seesaw's Teaching and Learning Excellence Hub uh, Steering Committee. So um, lots of long names in there, but got them all out. Um, so I, I'm very happy to be here today with all of you. We have a great mix of uh, U of G faculty members, community partners, staff, students in here. Um, so I'm very pleased with that. And our panel also reflects um, a great range of uh, the folks involved in a lot of the community engaged learning partnerships that uh, myself and my colleague Melissa, uh, right over there, uh, support uh, through SESI across campus, among uh, other folks here um, who support great partnerships uh, in the room as well, uh, who work across campus. So um, as Byron mentioned, I'm very lucky to uh, have this space here today. So um, this is the first time I've seen it this morning. This is Seesaw's new interdisciplinary hub space. So um, it's really great to now have a space that's specifically meant to um, be somewhere where folks can collaborate across disciplines. So um, myself, Melissa, and other staff members here on campus work with a bunch of different community partners uh, that span different fields and different courses that um, are within you know seesaws departments and beyond but this is a space where we can really all come together and um, I, I'm guessing that a lot of uh, the work of folks in this room and a lot of disciplines that they're associated with um, come from uh, a range uh, across seesaws and, and beyond so um, I, I hope that this panel is uh, one of the first events uh, that kind of helps folks come together and have those important conversations across um, some of the silos that we kind of find ourselves in here at the university. Um, so beyond this, uh, I want this panel today to be an interactive panel. Um, so I'm definitely going to, uh, in a couple of minutes, stop talking and get out of the way so uh, panelists can start uh, introducing themselves and a bit of the work they've been involved in. So. Um, today, I'm going to start by having our panelists each take a few minutes to introduce themselves and their position from which they come to community-engaged teaching and learning from. Um, and if you're curious what we mean by community-engaged teaching and learning, um, in front of you on your tables, you have just a, a brief outline of who our panelists are. 
Uh, they'll introduce themselves in a minute. And you also have an outline of kind of uh, one definition of community engaged learning and one definition of community focused learning. And you'll hear about kind of what these mean to various people and how uh, folks approach these as we go through the session. Um, if you have questions about the definitions, please feel free to put up your hand and, and ask us uh, up here, ask our panelists. And um, I hope we just have a really good uh, discussion today. And um, without further ado, I think I will start uh, by having each panelist introduce themselves. And then after everyone kind of introduces themselves and like I said, situates themselves within uh, CEL partnerships, uh, we'll kind of throw it out to you all to ask questions and uh, we'll get a good discussion going from there, if that sounds good. Okay, great. So uh, Adam, do you mind if I start with asking you to introduce yourself and just tell us a bit about your experience in CEL and yeah. Okay, so my name is uh, Adam Bonnycastle. I am the geomatics staff member in Department of Geography, Environment, and Geomatics. Uh, so basically uh, supporting teaching and research with all things <coughs> spatial, whether that's geographic information systems or uh, remote sensing and so on. And I also uh, work as a sessional instructor uh, for our undergrad GIS courses on a fairly regular uh, basis. Uh, now, one of those courses is our fourth year capstone uh, project that if uh, Wen Hong Yang is not teaching it, I'm typically the one doing that. And it is basically a series of student-conceived uh, GIS projects. Uh, and over the past few years, uh, we've been sort of moving towards at least providing two or three opportunities per year um, where it's a more formal uh, partnership between uh, student groups and a specific community uh, with a community-engaged uh, project. Uh, and so a couple of examples uh, of that would be uh, we've worked with the City of Guelph in determining alternative bike routes uh, throughout the uh, urban area, uh, as well as uh, community gardens where they could potentially go uh, within uh, the city and so on. Um, so I think I come at this largely from kind of an applied uh, point of view and sort of some of the lessons we've learned in partnering sort of student groups with community partners. Uh, and that's the sorts of things that I can speak to. Uh, and what I'm hoping to get out of this is more sort of knowledge about uh, the foundational aspects of community learning uh, and so on. Thanks, Adam. And um, I forgot to mention this before, but on the second page of your handout, you have a brief uh, summary of some of the partnerships that the uh, folks up here have been involved in. So um, there's some details here, and feel free to ask more uh, about them as we go through the session. Uh, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you next. Sure. Uh, my name is Tom Armitage, and I'm the Social Enterprise Development Coordinator of the SEED Community Food Project here in Guelph. And the SEED is a project of the Guelph Community Health Center, where we're trying to increase physical and financial access to healthy food among food insecure people in Guelph. And we're going about that in several different ways, uh, one of which is through the social enterprise um, format of delivering programs. So the idea is that uh, if you're food insecure, it's likely an income-based issue. So how can we decrease the cost of food for people overall? And how can we get food, healthier food, into communities where uh, there's poor physical access? Uh, so then my partnerships with uh, SESI overall over the last four years or so uh, we've done about 20 projects together, and they've ranged from needs assessments, uh, so identifying whether an intervention is actually needed in, in a community and what sort of intervention a community would like, uh, to evaluations. So if we're looking to um, not prove that we're doing something well, but improve what we're doing, um, then we could partner with uh, the university on that to get that third party arm's length away from uh, the responses that are given within a survey. Um, and we've worked with undergraduate classes, graduate classes. We've worked um, in all sorts of different departments, um, whether that's uh, Masters of Applied Nutrition courses, um, all the way to um, the John F. Wood Center, the formerly C base, um, on business components of, of what we do. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions uh, related to the community side of um, the discussion here today, and um, looking forward to it. Tom, do you want to say a bit about uh, the partnerships you're currently involved with now, sure. uh, either with Loris course or, or yeah, otherwise? Yeah, definitely. So uh, we're currently working with um, Laura's class, uh, Master's of Applied Nutrition course, uh, evaluating our community food uh, market uh, social enterprise. And we're evaluating it in such a way that um, we, like the, the program we offer sells produce on a sliding scale. So we want to know whether or not um, people who are purchasing the low-cost produce are moving from a state of 
uh, either severe food insecurity to marginal food insecurity, or from marginal to or from moderate to marginal. Uh, and are we increasing physical and financial access to healthy food through this program? Uh, so it's been uh, a great process to go through. We've worked with them in the past on evaluating a different pro project, uh, so we have the full confidence that uh, we're going to have a, a great um, outcome as a result. Uh, working with uh, Kate Perizzo in the back there as well in the Aero Food Institute um, on our kitchen-based projects. Uh, I'll elaborate on that in, in a question period because it's, it's a bit of a, a thing to get into. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Laura. Um, hi, my name is Laura Forbes and I'm a professor in the Department of Family Relations and Applied Nutrition. Um, and I have been, uh, I guess I am involved with um, community engaged learning um, through, I have been engaged through two different courses that I teach. Right now I am teaching a course with, uh, that is in our um, Masters of Applied Nutrition program. So this is a one-year course-based masters. And so their major research project of this course-based mas masters is a community-engaged project. So they spent, spend an entire year working with some kind of a community project. Um, and one of our groups is working with the SEED this year. We have um, numerous groups. Some of our community partnerships uh, come through SESI and some of them don't. Um, and I would say that I am probably getting to be a relatively experienced person in this area. Um, I did 10 community partnership projects last year and we've got seven going this year. Um, so uh, if you would like to know what it's like to be uh, a professor who is teaching a community engaged uh, learning course, I can speak to that. I can also speak to the student experience uh, and some of the challenges and, and benefits that I see for my students. Um, what else would I like to say? Um, that is the main thing. Is there anything else? Uh, that sounds good to me for now, okay. yeah. <laughs> we can go on to Stephanie. Hi everybody, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Steph Howells and I'm a professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. And I teach three um, undergraduate classes per term. The one that I have been using a variation of community engaged uh, scholarship with is a second year undergraduate class out of the Crime and Criminal Justice program. It's a criminological theory course. And so you might think, how do you use this class with theory? Well, um, I have adapted uh, Professor Morton, where is she? Mavis Morton's wonderful assignment to be used in a theory class where we, instead of using what's called traditionally community engaged learning, um, it's community focused learning. So our students are actually told to not talk to anyone. And so that goes against what a lot of, I think everybody else is doing, and I can talk more um, later. I also have copies of the assignment if you're interested. Um, students are told to research community organizations, local, international, um, things that are related to crime and criminal justice, understand the organization, their mandate, their focus, and then create a project that benefits that organization. So it might be to raise awareness for an organization that is looking for you know, more clients or more resources. It might be to run a clothing drive. It might be um, to create some posters for them or even a research project so that the organization can have um, you know, a literature review that they could use on their website. So I have a slew of or, um, examples because we have about a, around 300 students in the class every term, which is why we can't do something that's more engaged because I just can't manage that. <laughs> so this allows them to have an experience with community, um, understand the community, and apply the criminological theories to these organizations that are dealing with crime and criminal justice. Um, I'm hoping today to figure out, truthfully, uh, for myself, of uh, other examples that I can give to students about organizations that they might be able to research for their partnerships, um, but also to kind of think about community-focused learning in different ways, which I always get out of these sessions. Um, and whatever you want to learn from me, I will do my best, and I may defer to Mavis in the back. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Jade. Hi, I'm Jade Ferguson. I'm faculty in the School of English and Theater Studies. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why I'm on this panel, but I'm <laughs> no expert. And I think my entry into community aid learning was really sort of a matter of stumbling into different people at sort of opportune times. Um, so one thing I should say is that sort of uh, I'm from the School of English and Theater Studies. Theater has had a, a much longer history of doing community engaged 
projects, English not so. We have a book, why else would we, we don't need anything else, just the book. Um, and so in English there isn't really much of a model for how to do community engaged in learning. Um, AJ has been doing it for uh, many years. Um, we see him as a unicorn. Uh, uh, and he's primarily done it in a small class of 10 to 15 students, sometimes even less, with uh, grad, grad classes. Um, and uh, so it's not something that we typically do. I think that sort of, I fell into it partly due to other relationships that I was having um, that sort of culminated in a, a bunch of black cultural uh, 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 events that were happening. Um, so initially I was assigned a course that's called uh, Cultural Location Identity, Minoritized Literature in Canada Beyond. It's a 2000 level class that typically has around 50 to 60 students. Um, and I had already taught the class before about sort of um, our redress and reconciliation and what's going to teach it that way. And then Griffin's Reads was like, we have David Chirandi coming, can he come to your class? And I was like, oh, this doesn't really fit, fine. And so David came and then I uh, had relationships with the Cultural Diversity Office and they were bringing the Afronauts to campus and Camille Turner. And then I had a relationship with the Art Gallery of Guelph and they were having critical mass. And all of a sudden, they all wanted to be part of my class. And all of a sudden I was teaching a class that I didn't think I'd be teaching. Um, and that's one of the issues that I, I'd like to talk about. Um, so all of a sudden I was teaching a black Canadian literature and culture class to a group of white students and partnering with the Guelph Black Heritage Society. Um, and so um, this was a class that I wouldn't typically teach here, uh, a partnership that I uh, stumbled into, thankfully. <laughs> um, uh, but all of it was very new and had a lot of risks and surprisingly a lot of rewards too. Great, thank you very much, Shade. Um, Denise. <coughs> My name is Denise Francis, and I'm the uh, President and Treasurer of the Guelph Black Heritage Society. Uh, we're a fairly new organization that was formed in 2011. Um, our main purpose is that we are the owners of a building uh, that was built in 1880 um, from, by the members of the black community who came to Canada as slaves. And when they found, um, were looking for a place to settle, Guelph was actually one of the communities they settled in. So our building is, um, we call it the Heritage Hall now, but it was uh, formerly a British Methodist Episcopal, Episcopalian Church, uh, BME Church. And it's our mission to restore the building back to its former glory and also to share our black culture with um, people from Guelph, Wellington and beyond. Um, one of the reasons, uh, we're new to the uh, partnership with SESI and one of the reasons why we wanted to partner was that um, we, there's really an absence of resources about the black community and uh, people don't realize um, that our community has been around since the 1880s. I grew up in Guelph and I wasn't really aware of this until I became a student here at the University of Guelph myself in the 90s. So we are looking for resources. People actually come to us and say, what do you have about the black community? And we really don't have anything. Uh, we worked with Jade's class earlier this year and the students did a number of projects and uh, many are posted on the, a blog site which has um, had about 3,000 engagements on our website, which is absolutely amazing because before we'd only get about maybe 100 or 200 people clicking and, and looking at our projects. So it's increased our profile. Um, many of our past um, projects or events uh, would skew towards an older demographic and by working with the university, we're having uh, people of younger, younger ages um, becoming aware of our organization and participating in, in our projects. So. That's it. Thank you very much, Denise. Okay, so um, we've heard a little bit about where our panelists are coming to community engaged learning from. Um, some folks are uh, a little bit newer to working in these types of partnerships. Some folks have been through at least a few uh, different partnership cycles. So, um, because as I mentioned before at the beginning, I'd like the bulk of this session to be more interactive and, and give a chance, uh, chance for the audience to ask questions of our panelists. Um, I'd like to throw it out to the floor now and um, we can take your questions. Uh, if you want me to kick it off with a question of my own, I can do that. But I'd like to put it out to you first. So um, does anyone have a question for our panel uh, around community-engaged learning? Yes. I just uh, 
Yeah, the one where I'm from, geography, yeah, you remember the mathematics. Sorry, I'll come back Sorry. with the Sorry. microphone. Sorry. forgot to mention okay. that. There you go. Hi. So actually, it's, uh, it's really fascinating to see all this community engagement. But I'd like to ask a question a little bit um, uh, different angle is that um, when we engage communities, and uh, of course, in this coordinated way, I think it's better. What I'm saying that is that sometimes if we just poke around, and some organization may be exhausted by resources and uh, in doing that. So what I'm saying that is because in my own experience, and I did have that kind of situation, students contact the same organization, just go around and doing that. Student, they don't want to email me, say, one well, well, home, you, you should stop that. I say, I do not know. Students go for that way. Anyway, so I just a little different angle to see what's your opinion on that. Thanks. Thank you. Does anyone want to take a first uh, time to respond to that? I, I can respond. Yeah. Um, so like you said, it's great to have an intermediary between uh, the university and community partners. Uh, and they do it, like the research shop, for instance, and, uh, and Lindsay, through her role, do a great job in, in mediating that, um, that concern where people are just coming to you directly and um, maybe there's 10 people who write you and say, hey, can I work on this? I love what you're doing. Uh, and um, usually we just try to steer them into volunteer roles um, if we have them available. Um, but they, like the research shop and, and um, SESI in general, uh, usually put out calls to say whether or not your organization is looking to do a project this term or for this period of time. And usually we do, uh, but there are times where we don't. And it's just like, okay, if you don't, then you don't. No big deal, right? Um, and then there's other times where, uh, like, we have projects that um, we say, we'd love to have this, um, get this going. Do you have the resources to be able to do it? And uh, usually the answer is either yes now or yes, we will in the next little while. So it's great to, to have that dialogue between uh, specific people at the university um, to get it going that way. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so. I think this is one of the pros of community-focused learning is that um, students may all flock towards one particular um, organization, but the organization wouldn't know, given this assignment. Yeah. Yeah. And because students need to understand the organization, I think the ones that are more um, well-known um, are maybe easier for students to to find out about, but harder for them to create a project about. Because something like Crime Stoppers doesn't need you to raise awareness, <coughs> right? So students will then turn towards an organization that is lesser known, that could still have a great impact, and they'll focus on them instead. Um, so yeah, there's pros to actually not talking to people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else who has a question uh, for the panel at this time? Okay, um, I can ask one then. Um, so let me see here. So um, we have quite the diversity of partnerships, diversity of um, levels of intense, uh, sorry, intensity of engagement, I would say. So um, some students aren't going out and connecting directly with community partners and some are. And um, in my role, because I kind of uh, touch so many different partnerships in different ways, um, I'm always trying to be conscious of how do we um, ensure that we're, uh, critically engaging with community and not uh, unconsciously or consciously perpetuating inequities that might exist between the university and community, um, the community representatives and organizations and the folks they serve. Um, so I guess it's kind of a big question, but I'm, I want to ask the panel, how can we ensure that we're not perpetuating inequities or at least are consciously striving not to through our partnerships in CEL in terms of our processes, our knowledge that we're generating, our goals, and um, the products or deliverables that, uh, that we're going for. Yeah. Does anyone feel like they want to jump in and start on that one? Or? It's a hard one. It's a hard one. It's a big one, I know. <laughs> um, so for me, what, what I try my best to do in my role um, is really start from community needs. So um, like I think Jade was saying, uh, you kind of got pulled into a partnership randomly by a bunch of different folks with, you know, coming to you for various needs. And um, that's kind of my experience at SESI in, in my role in trying to facilitate these types of partnerships. So um, there's folks coming from the community side, there's folks coming from um, faculty member side, and we kind of just try and make two really unconnected things sometimes that are going like this kind of match up. Uh, and if they don't, that's fine. Um, 
I, I try to start from grounding something in real community needs and then um, being really conscious of times where I think, oh yes, I think this can work. I think you know these folks will get along. They, they have common goals and priorities. And then also being really honest when the timing isn't right. So um, for example, I or, or processes that probably don't work as well for um, the community folks that we work with. So um, increasingly, we are just talking about um, students uh, going out more and more to community, really wanting to engage, but uh, not necessarily knowing how, and, and community partners or certain partners being approached by uh, multiple students over and over again. And more and more, um, I have students approaching me uh, with questions about, oh, I really, like, I have this course or I have this thesis that I'd really love to connect to a community partner and their needs uh, for and I often am like okay I can I can try and work with this but I, I also don't always have an answer and um, I find that like I said the the timing of things and and kind of really just making sure that uh, as much as possible in our intermediary roles that we are connected to existing community needs and can really um, be those liaisons and communicators across university and community um, lines to uh, help everyone understand kind of the parameters that we're all working in, which can can differ quite a bit sometimes is, is where I start. So I don't know if that resonated with anyone uh, on the panel or uh, in our audience here, if anyone has anything to add uh, to what I just said. I can say um, many people don't realize that the Global Black Heritage Society is a totally volunteer organization. Mm -hmm. So for mm -hmm. example, me being here means that I've taken half a vacation day. And mm -hmm. so when the students were engaged in a Jade's project, I had quite a few contact us. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt badly, but there's only so many of us, but mm -hmm. we have to balance our time, our jobs, our personal lives, and other things that we want to do. So yeah. that's a big consideration for us, um, you know, embarking on these partnerships. So. Absolutely, and, and a lot of the organizations we work with uh, are heavily run by volunteers, so that, that's an actual excellent point. And I think more and more um, on the equity side of things, I think myself and I know others at the university are always thinking about how to best resource these partnerships, and that, just, that doesn't just mean faculty members, staff, and students, that means folks on the community side. And I'm very conscious of the fact that um, expansions to experiential learning um, often come with funds from the government and others uh, to universities, but that doesn't flow to communities that we work with. So um, that's another point that I've really uh, noticed in, in my role over the years. Yeah, yeah. Um, does anyone else have anything to add uh, to that? Just on related, I think one of the things that we found, uh, particularly with the fourth year uh, project course, is being able to use a resource like SESI to uh, sort of help guide the relationship between the students and the community partners, um, both in terms of keeping the students sort of on the same track as the partners in terms of what the final deliverables are. Uh, because the first time we did this, uh, a community partner came uh, to myself, I was instructing the course that semester, sort of said, are there groups who would like to, or a group who would like to study this topic, and there was, and then that group went and did it, and at the end, I think it was useful work, but it wasn't really aligned with that partner's sort of goals of what they were intending to get out of it. Um, so, you know, working with SESI, for instance, has been great on um, helping keep the students uh, aligned with what the partner's goals are without um, sort of over needing from the partner in terms of like weekly meetings or, or anything mm -hmm. like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Adam. And then as a community partner, uh, there's that other side of the token too where you want to make sure that uh, you're not taking advantage of the community itself, um, mm -hmm. meaning that there's a mutual benefit in participation in surveys and needs assessments and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So one example would be uh, we opened up a market in the East End of Guelph last year but prior to doing that, we didn't want to assume that that intervention was needed despite, you know, newspaper articles and uh, people, you know, advocating for a grocery store in, in that area of town. We wanted to talk to people who might actually benefit from market in that location. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're doing a needs assessment and speaking with um, community members, we also want to be aware of the fact that, you know, we're more or less suggesting a solution, but we don't want to do that unless we're confident that we can actually follow through with that solution. So, mm -hmm. And if we weren't mm -hmm. confident, then maybe it is a situation where we're asking the questions and giving nothing back. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we're confident we can do it, then we'll ask the questions. If it's something that the community decides that they would like, we'll go ahead with that intervention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So it's something to, to think about anytime you're doing 
community-based research, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. And, and do you find um, the research projects you've done, have those helped you get some insight as to whether the interventions that uh, you're running are, are effective or you know working in the ways that you would hope they would and has that helped you kind of shift uh, your work in any way or it has yeah so we did an evaluation of one of our programs in 2016 through the masters of applied nutrition course and uh, found that it was really heavily valued by the community that participates in that program uh, to the point where people wished it happened more often and it's a box based program people could buy produce uh, $15 or $20 but it was only once a month uh, so then people saw that they were saving 24, 48% of the cost of produce, but it wasn't lasting them very long, because mm -hmm. it's a week's worth of produce, so what do you do for those other three weeks? So they wanted mm -hmm. it to happen once every two weeks, or once a week, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so then through that, we did uh, an assessment of that program itself, and whether or not we could um, propel that forward, uh, to have it more often. Uh, but it turned out that we couldn't do it with that structure, so we developed a, a market-based model instead. Uh, and then did a needs assessment based on that. Okay, great. Yeah. great. So it's been incredibly valuable for sure. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, one thing that's come into my head while we've been talking is that um, that valuing community members when you're doing something like an evaluation, uh, valuing their time, valuing, valuing their expertise and their experience as a community member is really important. So examples would be if we're asking people who are uh, seed community members to do surveys for us, they should be getting something out of that immediately as well as long term. Uh, we're doing a, um, a um, study about food, uh, student food insecurity as well, um, and we're really lucky that we're able to pay people to be focus group members, for example. Because if you've got somebody who has food insecurity and you want an hour and a half of their time that they could be working and making money to help them combat food insecurity, then not paying them is not valuing um, something that is always a, already a really uh, important resource for, the, uh, for these people. Mm -hmm. so, um, so keeping in mind the value of those community members and treating that appropriately I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And funds yeah. are important and not always easy to come by. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Been lucky this, uh, this round. Yes, and that's where I was going to go uh, next, just briefly mentioning. So, um, SESI has a CEL course support fund that uh, we put, uh, it, it's up to $500 <coughs> that can be accessed per academic year. So that goes towards help supporting um, these kinds of courses. And um, the other thing is that the, the Teaching and Learning Excellence Hub now has a new fund, um, not just for community engaged learning courses, obviously, but um, to support teaching and learning within the college. So that's another fund that um, we can put towards uh, these kind of partnerships. So if anyone has questions about those, um, there's folks in the room that can answer that along uh, with me. So um, I think I saw a hand over here. Alex? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my job, yes. <laughs> So uh, my name is Alex. I'm the manager of the climate change office of the city. Um, we've had a, a number of pieces of work that have been done by students and in collaboration with SESI. And w one of them was, I, I, I hesitate to call it community engaged scholarship in the sense of geographically a community. It was a community of practice. Uh, so people involved in energy management at the municipal scale across Ontario. Um, so it was, in my view, a, a tremendous success where we had uh, students out surveying members of this community of practice and learning what they thought of, of um, uh, how the group worked, um, how the interactions worked, whether, whether they, uh, they were getting value out of it and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the, the challenges that I have had, um, and I'd be interested in your, your feedback on, on this, um, we don't necessarily operate on the same calendar as universities. So there seems to be a couple of sweet spot times in the year where starting a project works really well. Um, more so at the undergrad level, I think that there's a little bit more flexibility when you're starting to deal with uh, graduate students, but um, I'm just curious to know <coughs> how you or your partners have coped with that timing issue of like, you got four months uh, for a course and then you're kind of moving on to the next one. Uh, does anyone <coughs> want to take a first stab at that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am lucky in that my course is, uh, spans an entire year, so we have a little bit more flexibility with my course than with other courses in terms of how much time we've got. Um, I did teach um, another uh, program evaluation course, which was two semesters rather than three semesters, and that is tighter. So the kinds of things that 
as a faculty member I have to be able to do is um, I have to be able to connect with somebody like Ceci who can make sure that the needs of the community partner and the timing suits my timing. Um, there is also the possibility to do things like pre-planning of projects and we did a, an example of that this year where we had somebody working for us in the summer to prep a project so that it would be ready to go right away in September, which our students wouldn't be able to do themselves. Um, other things include being flexible, um, include being willing to pick up the phone and say, hey, research ethics, can you speed this along for me because I've got students who really need to get this done now. Um, and just other kinds of sort of out of the box brainstorming. And so that happens within the course, it happens with our SESI partners, it can happen with our community partners too, but uh, kind of thinking of outside the box about how things can get done and trying to slot things in any way that we can. Okay. Those are my best suggestions. Great, yeah. thank you, Laura. Um, anyone else? Adam? Yeah, I think in our case we've got sort of, it's a pro and a con, but um, we have one semester, uh, not the whole year, uh, but we know it's always the winter semester. And so the other sort of nice thing is, in our case, we're not so much working with individual community members, but rather representatives of that community, so whether it's uh, the seed or uh, the city with the uh, bike infrastructure and so on. Uh, and so that sort of allows us to do a little bit of pre-planning in the sense of saying, okay, well, we've got this particular topic. We can do a little bit of thinking about it uh, to give the students some ideas beforehand uh, and develop that understanding with the community group that if this is going to happen, it's going to be in that winter semester. Um, and if it's not going to happen in that winter semester, well, then maybe there's an opportunity the next winter, which isn't an ideal because it's a year away. But at the same time, it's a very defined set of here's what we're capable of and it will be happening during these times and let's think about what can happen within that scope. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is from, from our students' projects point of view, um, they're often uh, first pass projects that allow the community um, partner to think more about the data that they're involved with as opposed to coming up with a definite solution to the problem. So uh, we've had two, taking the city's example for, uh, for a moment, we've had two groups look at alternative bike uh, routes throughout the city to avoid large arterial roads. I've noticed um, after that, um, signed bike lanes, or not bike lanes, but signed bike routes through residential neighborhoods. I don't think for a moment that our students um, came up with the final solution, but I think that um, what they were able to come up for the city at least influenced thinking and gave them um, more information to make a final decision on. Great. Thanks, Adam. Um, is there anyone else that wanted to add anything? I can add to that. Yeah. Um, so I think of projects in, in three different ways, or three different categories of, of projects. One is like the semester-based uh, project that, um, in my experience at least, has been more like an under, undergraduate level. Uh, and it's fixed in time, January to April, September to December, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the year-long courses, which have typically been uh, more grad student-based, where they integrate your community project into uh, the greater body of work that they're working on for that year or two years. But then there's also the research shop. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, with that. Um, but essentially, they have uh, project interns and project managers who work on projects, community-based projects, um, that span outside of that or can span outside of it, where uh, if you have a year-long project that um, maybe you don't have a course that you're working with, but there are project interns and managers who can work on it, um, they're not fixed to any particular schedule outside of the fact that they're grad students and may leave at some point, but maybe somebody else can come back in. So it could be something as quick as a one-month project or something that you want to uh, get going. It could be as long as a, a two-year thing. I don't know what the longest one you've had there at the research shop is, but it's not a, fixed within that year. Yeah. Great, thanks Tom. Um, I think I saw a hand back here, yes. Hi, good afternoon everybody. Um, I, so just a, a question um, for the um, university professors or the persons working at the university. So I'm working at a, on a group project for quantitative techniques, and that's the class I'm doing this semester, and it's looking at bulletins for trends in rural communities. I want to be able to use my research findings to help because our planner um, in a specific rural community indicated that my findings would be appreciated. 
but my project is limited and limiting, and I don't want to attempt to give recommendations outside the scope of my project. So what do you recommend that I do? Cool. Yeah, Steph? That sounds awesome. Um, I think you should talk to your professor if you haven't already because they will likely have recommendations for you. Um, but I think the way that you said it makes the most sense, right? I, I tell my students, because some of them are saying like, I don't want to just do this thing and never go forward with it. I want to actually have a contribution. Um, and so I help the student kind of uh, vet what they're doing before we pass it along to a potential, not a community partner, but the person that they were focused on. We've, um, I've helped them kind of craft emails to, to share it and say, do what you want with this, know that this was for a course project, you know, kind of know all of the background information. Um, and if you're opening yourself up, that they could then contact you for further information, I think that that would be wonderful. But go through your professor first, because they should have that. And then, of course, you could contact Ceci, because I'm sure they could help you navigate that as well. I'm volunteering you, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's my job, yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on um, the question? Um, my, I have two thoughts that are very, very similar, um, which are that um, trying to really figure out what wording is going to work to make sure that the community partner understands exactly what you're saying, I think it will be important. Um, so I'm assuming that the community partner is a lay person, they might not understand what your research really truly means. So being able to translate, tra translate for them about exactly what it does mean and what it doesn't mean is very important. Um, the other thing is that students can also get really excited about things that other people are interested in. Um, and can end up getting a little bit in over their head in order to try and meet expectations. Um, so be aware that that can happen and it is likely not worth your while to do that in a course and get maybe off track, maybe overloaded. Um, so try and keep that in mind. Um, and again, your professor could help you to make sure you're not going overboard. They can help you to find those words as well. Yep. <coughs> Thank you, Laura. Um, yes, uh, Francesco. Hi. Uh, so, uh, Laura just mentioned very briefly about the uh, uh, research ethics board and uh, how it gets really involved in all these things. And I just wanted to know if there was a general, um, your, the opinions. Is, is it working? Is it not working? Uh, uh, how is it perceived? Um, the perceptions around that, yeah. Okay. In this context. <laughs> in this context. Um, it is an ever-changing beast, is what I have figured out over the last few years. Um, but our ethics board historically has been fantastic. Uh, coming here from a different institution, I have not been at a university whose ethics board works as quickly as ours. Um, so coming from that mindset, our ethics board is amazing. Um, there have been challenges over the past few years. There's been a lot of change going on in our ethics board. Um, and so there have been times when ethics has slowed things down for some of our projects. Um, but my experience with the folks over at the ethics board is that if you call them up, they are really willing to help. They're willing to do things for students that they might not do for, you know, me just because it's my project. Um, so that has been my experience. So yes, is ethics a lot of work for these projects? Does it take time? Yes. Um, but I think our ethics board does as good a job as they can, um, which in my, according to my previous experiences, is really good compared to what I see at other institutions. So. I have a follow-up to that question about the internal um, stakeholders' experiences of ethics, and I'm very interested in hearing from people who are working based in community. Um, what are your experiences and perspectives on the the timelines that ethic involved, and even e e ethics involves? I think I did a trippy thing with tense there, but I'm also even more curious to hear from you what you wish we knew and did when we're working with you and your clients and members um, in terms of actual ethics, not legal butt covering. So if you, have, if you have things you wish we knew or would think about when we're planning our projects, I'm all ears. Um, so my experience with ethics is very similar to what Laura described, and uh, I see it as uh, an absolute necessity. And uh, I don't see it as um, 
you know, something that's just a pain in the butt that you have to go through, I think it, it uh, offers a lot of value, um, particularly when you're thinking through a project too. So it forces you to think through the things uh, that you should be thinking about when you're asking people questions. So I, I see tremendous value in that, uh, and I imagine that the students that we've worked with in the past see a lot of value in that as well. Uh, and it's just something that you get a sense of what the timelines are uh, for how long things generally take, and you just build that into your project planning. Uh, so you think it's going to take a couple months to get something back, let's just make sure we get it in by mid-December and should hear back mid-January, that kind of thing. So it, it hasn't been a big deal for us in, in that respect. Um, in terms of what to think about, um, it's hard to say because like, I've worked, and uh, I'm not just kissing butts here, but I've worked with some great people, uh, great students, great profs, great um, uh, project managers, that kind of thing, who just think through things very well because they're either very experienced or uh, are very passionate about the project and want to do well. So they think through things and how, how to ask questions and uh, manners in which uh, questions are best asked, that kind of thing. And I would just say on the ethics question, um, I would agree that we have great people and always willing to quickly try to address a urgent question or need. Um, and I think we need a very different process. <laughs> um, and I think there's things that you know we just need to think through that is different about doing community-engaged scholarship that isn't sort of possible or available um, with the kind of traditional structure and processes that we currently have and so we're excited about working on that which so are the folks at the research ethics board thanks Mavis and Janet you had a question yeah <clears throat> this is for Jade and Denise um, Jade you mentioned in uh, in your introduction that you know the way that the course sort of evolved was tricky and surprising and you know with anticipated challenges and some surprising rewards specifically in, as it uh, evolved for particularly a white student audience um, as well as Denise sharing that as a grassroots volunteer driven organization the the challenges that that creates also in being able to participate equitably in this type of learning which you know, can often, um, even with our best intentions, uh, weigh more heavily on the outputs for students than the organization itself. I'm just wondering from that perspective for both of you of, of struggling with that, what, are, what have you learned through this process that we can work better as in terms of an institution and supporters of community-engaged learning for ensuring students are really well prepared um, and that organizations um, that have less resources um, are, are, are supported in the way that they need to be to be able to not have to take a vacation day to come to a panel and be able to, to really be able to see how this work can impact um, their organizations as well. Start. Um, for me, the Black Heritage Society is a passion project, so I'm more than willing to, to take, devote my time to come here to events like this. I came to Jade's class to see the final projects, and I, you know, took time. I had conflicts my time. I met with Melissa during work hours and so on, so I'm a long-standing employee at my employer, so I have my six weeks of holidays, so I'm able to sort of flex my time and do things like that. Um, one of the things I, that's good is that the, some of the projects that were produced, like the blog, the Aphronautic Research Lab, uh, we presented it at the Heritage Hall on the weekend. So some of our members who don't have the flexibility that I do were able to participate at other times. The blog, it's posted online so everybody could see the project. So, so those are some excellent outputs that we had. Um, we have a couple of retirees who are able to help during some daytime things, but I will say it is a challenge for us working folks who don't have the time that I do to, to participate, but there's many other ways that they're able to see the projects and, and learn from uh, what was happening. So, uh, In terms of the class, for the most part, um, 
so, so in terms of what we were working on in terms of content was race, racism, uh, racial discrimination. Um, and so when uh, we had people coming in uh, talking, so the class is called Minoritized Voices. So it was important for me that we paid our minoritized voices who spoke to predominantly white students. So there were 45 students, five students were students of color. Um, and so uh, one of the things that was important for me was making sure that those who came into the class to share their experience and share their knowledge were properly compensated. So given the Canada Council rate uh, for coming into class and spending an hour, an hour and a half with us. Um, and at the same time, it was complicated. It was complicated in terms of, um, so I'll give one uh, particular incident in terms of thinking about how race and racial dynamics were playing. Um, so we were fortunate to have two people come into the course. Um, one was a young black woman, another one was a um, white um, middle-aged man. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, each of us were talking about sort of our, our relation to blackness uh, um, and uh, black culture, black culture production in Guelph and beyond. Um, we each had our own time limit. It was my, my course, <laughs> uh, but I opened it up. Um, so I perhaps spoke for 10 minutes, and then uh, the young black woman spoke for perhaps 15 minutes, and then for the next 40 minutes, the, elder, the older white man spoke about blackness and black people and said all kinds of interesting things and some things that were, were troubling. Um, and so sort of one of, for me, one of the risks of having uh, a community partner come in and speak to the class was that sort of we all of a sudden had a dynamic in which I really didn't want that dynamic to be replicated mm -hmm. by students um, who thought that sort of uh, presenting all your knowledge that you've read about black people <laughs> um, uh, was really important. It should be shared over the two black women who were standing in the corner um, looking at each other aghast. Um, so there were those various kinds of sort of um, ethical uh, and political risks that were happening um, and sort of various kinds of modeling that were happening as we were engaging each other in collaboration too and sort of knowledge and expertise and so forth. Um, and, and to go back to Janet's question, on the side of whether it's um, Ceci, staff like myself as intermediaries or um, yourself as a faculty member that had to kind of respond in the moment or just kind of deal with that situation. Um, how did you move forward to address it and is there ways we could have better supported that? Um, I think it was actually in part students, it was actually a very good experience for students because you could see students were getting uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you know, seeing how, what happens when um, book knowledge <laughs> gets sort of uh, prioritized over experiential knowledge um, and, and things like that. So it was actually a, a, an important moment for them uh, to see um, how sort of, uh, how sort of in, in the classroom, seeing how voices become minoritized in, in that very process. Mm -hmm. So from, yeah. Sorry, and as an organization, that's actually something that we have struggled with. Um, we, one of the sort of, as an aside, the funniest thing is that we had two white men describing cultural appropriation to a group of black people, and we were trying to explain to them what, what, what was wrong with their conversation. They so just, just like Jay described, they shut us out while they argued among themselves. So from them, it was for us, it was a learning experience because we didn't realize it was such a. It, again, we felt uncomfortable, but we didn't know what to stop, how to stop it. It was almost like a train wreck almost. So yeah. it's learning, we found it was like a learning experience for us as to who we want to be out there presenting our organization. And um, so, so we've learned from that, so, yeah. So uh, obviously these dynamics exist everywhere mm -hmm. and they um, manifest in certain ways when they're brought into CEL partnerships and I think um, you know, for, for myself, when I think about my social location, um, I, I don't always have the answers for that, but I definitely want to be there um, in, in ways that are needed. And um, Ceci as an institute believe, feels the same way. 
Um, so more and more we're moving towards um, critical community engaged scholarship that really brings that social justice lens uh, to our work and that means that um, you know we're, we're reaching out and seeing um, what the appetite is to a broader set of organizations than we might have worked with in the past but um, obviously there there's a lot of messiness there um, and I'm really uh, feel privileged to be a part of these conversations and hear um, your thoughts on it and everyone else's so um, I know we're coming to the end of our time together um, I wanted to just put it back to the panelists to see if there's any final comments and um, I don't know that we have time for more questions but I feel like we got a really good discussion going here today and I'm kind of sad that we have to cut it off now um, but yeah are there any final comments from any of our panelists uh, to take us to the end of the session I, I would just like to say thank you for the partnerships that we've had. The, I can see the tangible results. Um, I'm a numbers person, so when I look at uh, the increase in attendance, the decrease in the demographics at our events, the increase in social media followers, followers and um, hits to our website and social media, I can see those are tangible results from the partnership that we had with SESI, and, and we're very grateful for that. Great, thank you. We're so glad to hear that. Thank you. Anyone else have any final comments? Lead us out? No? Um, I have one other comment that kind of builds off of what was just being said, which is that when things don't go as you expect and maybe go wrong, is sometimes when some of the best student learning happens. And that is one of the powerful things about uh, community engaged learning. So that was a really powerful example of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think unless anyone has any final comments, I will wrap it up there. Thank you so much to each of our panelists. Um, we really, really appreciate your time and your input here today. Um, I hope that we can have uh, events similar to this and different than this uh, to bring us all together to keep the conversation going. So uh, thank you to the Teaching and Learning Excellence Hub group for your support. And uh, yeah, thank you all for attending here today.